Welcome to Making Mixed Reality Trailers and Videos. Please welcome your speaker, Kurt Gartner. Hi, everybody. Alrighty, so thank you for showing up, everybody. This should be uh, pretty fun, and I'm actually like super honored to be here. This is like super crazy because uh, I'm from a small town in the middle of nowhere of Canada called Winnipeg. Uh, it's pretty far technologically from a place like this, so it's pretty neat to be here speaking to you here today. So just to give you a quick background on who I am and why I'm up in front of you talking today, uh, this is me as a kid. I uh, was really into things like trick photography, obviously video games, and this really obscure, obscure uh, form of cosplay where you like dress up as the media of your favorite characters. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, but I did dress up as a VHS tape for Halloween. Uh, 30 years uh, later, not much has really changed. Um, like one of the earlier speakers, I spent about eight years working in the visual effects industry. I worked on about 25 or so uh, Hollywood movies, sort of B2C grade stuff. And the VFX industry, for anybody that's been a part of it, you know, it's kind of insane, especially now. Lots of crunch, lots of 80, 100 hour weeks, and you know, I was having a family and wanted to sort of get out. And so I started looking at options and figuring out what I wanted to do. And eventually I met an indie game developer called uh, Alec Coloca, and we started hanging out together. And I started, got, I started getting into the independent video game scene. And what we did is we made this really cool arcade cabinet called the Winitron 1000, and I started making trailers for the games that we started putting on that. And at the time, you know, in the indie game industry, it was sort of, you know, just burgeoning and just starting to get really, really going, like with games like Fez and Braid and whatnot. And I was able to produce these really, really high quality visual effects trailers for small independent video games, and nobody had ever really seen anything like that before. So they started to go viral on the internet, and it just started to really slowly build momentum. We did one and did another, and they kept getting 100,000 views and whatnot, and eventually people started asking me to make trailers for their own games. And now, three and a half years odd later, that's what I do basically all full time. So, which led me to these two trailers right here for Job Simulator and Fantastic Contraption. Now, as most people probably know, these are two of the three sort of pack-in titles for the Vive. So, the pressure was on, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, one of the Job Sim guys was in Winnipeg at the time, and so we knew him and I had been talking to him back and forth. And so when Colin, uh, one of the guys behind Fantastic Contraption, got in touch with me in January, I was like, hey, let's, I know you guys are doing something too, so why don't we try to do both of these trailers at the same time and we'll try to do something really cool with them. And that was kind of like the best and worst decision of my life because it was incredibly amazing to do, but it was so much work and it was so stressful at the time. So uh, before we look at these two trailers and what we did for them, I just kind of want to talk about this sort of big elephant in the room here. And this is that VR has this crazy communications problem, right? Everybody's obviously seen the cover of Time magazine with Palmer very unluckily <laughs> posed in that way. And these are stock images. You can buy these images on the internet. This is what virtual reality is, right? Yeah, I, what the hell is that, you know? So it's like, <laughs> that one especially, that one's great. So it's like, what, like, how do you communicate what it's like to be inside of this fully interactive, immersive world that you can touch things and move around and do all this really amazing thing? And it obviously is not that. So. <laughs> Let's take a look at what people have been doing so far. And I guess the first thing that people really did was this sort of dual fisheye view because that was the raw output out of the Oculus. And it's like, hey, look at this virtual reality. You got this distorted fisheye view with chromatic aberration and it looks like crap. And people are putting these up on the internet and expecting them to get excited about VR. And obviously nobody is because that looks awful, right? And so it's probably one of the worst ways to, you know, output, a, a, like, output your game because it just looks bad. And there's two views, they look identical. Why is there two? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, first person view is like, okay, this is a little bit better, but the problem with first person view is that your camera, or your head rather, is really the worst possible camera in the world. It's shaky, it's moving around like crazy, you're not focusing on anything for any point of time, and there's all sorts of micro movements that your head is doing that your eyeballs and brain kind of cancel out, but all of that translates to the 2D footage when you start to look at it. And it, I get actually motion sick watching this clip at 60 frames a second, and I feel it gross afterwards, it's so bad. And then someone came up with the bright ideas, let's do picture in picture, we'll put this dude in his dirty room in the lower corner, and that's an awesome idea because you can see them doing stuff, but nobody wants to see your dirty room, who cares, right? So <laughs> there's all these problems with that. Some of the other things that people are doing are kind of interesting. Sony, when they announced the, the I guess the Morpheus when it was that, the PSVR rack right now, 
they did these sort of virtual head mount displays. And I kind of like this idea for one reason, and that's that you get to see the emotion of the person that's actually under the head mount display, right? So you can see their eyes, you can see their facial expression, you can connect to that as a viewer. The problem with it is it's completely fake. They're not actually playing the game because you need the bloody headset on your head in order to actually see what's going on, right? So the other problem with it is it's all done in post, right? So you're 3D tracking the person's head, there's probably tracking markers all over it, and you gotta paint those out, and then you gotta pay someone to make a 3D head mount display and put that on there and deposit it in properly. There's a lot of time and money involved in doing that. Um, on the left is one of the earlier trailers that the Alchemy guys did for Job Simulator. And this actually doesn't look, well, once it loops again here, it doesn't look super bad. It, it you know, looks relatively smooth. It's better than the other video that we saw earlier. The problem with that is I was talking to Devin, that took them 50 takes to get right. It is highly choreographed and they're moving their head very slowly and very deliberately and you're holding your hands up like this. And it's very, very, very hard to get right. So these are some of the major stumbling blocks that are coming or, or that are, you know, people have when they're trying to you know, market their games. And so when it came time to do these two trailers, we kind of wanted to solve as many of these problems as we could. So we wanted to find a way to show what it's like to be inside a virtual reality in a 2D format that people can watch on their phone and that's super engaging. So uh, we're gonna look at Job Simulator first and it has a little bit of mixed reality in it and then uh, Fantastic Contraption has, is basically completely mixed reality. Hello, human. Welcome to an accurate simulation of Office Worker. Time to jump. This looks like it'll taste interesting. Pistons in the engine, don't need those. <laughs> Delicious. Oh no, the boss bot is coming. Hey, human, you've been doing a good job. Looks like I've got some money to blow. Shred everything for legal reasons. Today's not your lucky day, pal. Open that safe. Holy smokes, this is way too hard. You've been doing a really good job lately. I think it's about time you got a promotion. Hooray, it's five o'clock. <laughs> Woohoo, it's time to go home. Yeah, I'm gonna have to ask you to come in on Saturday. All right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, next one we're gonna take a look at here is the uh, mixed reality trailer for Fantastic Contraption. Fantastic Contraption is a game about building and using your creativity. The challenge of the game is simple. You have to get the pink ball to the pink goal. And to do that, you have to build a fantastic contraption. Thanks, guys. So, 
Why shoot a mixed reality trailer? Well, I just think it's the best way to convey what it's like to be in virtual reality on a 2D screen. And I don't think I'm the only person that thinks this. Uh, even Valve, the you know trailer they did for the release of the Vive was almost completely mixed reality. They were showing a bit of the green screen, they were showing people on the couch, they were doing a lot of the similar things that we were doing to Fantastic Contraption. Um, their version is a little bit different, they use a little bit of a different technique, but the end result is roughly the same. The compositing is a little bit different than ours and everything else, but it's essentially the same sort of goal. And everybody has probably seen the Google Tilt Brush trailer that came out, a couple, I guess, a couple months ago. And this is also an incredible use of mixed reality, though the way that they did this is completely different than the way that we did ours. It's a little bit more VFX, you know, traditional VFX than mixed reality. But again, the end result is basically the same. Something a little bit more recent, and that people are starting to do these on their own, this is a little clip from this game called Blasters of the Universe. And this kind of just shows you how hard it actually is to do mixed reality well. There's a lot of problems with this. There's a shaky camera, there's poor compositing. You're always looking at the person's butt, you know, that's a big issue. And one of the things about this is this game is super fun to play, but that person doesn't look completely engaged. You just, when you're making a mixed reality trailer or video, it's really a performance as well because this person is in there and you're watching them and you can tell how excited they are by watching them. So we'll talk about how we resolved a few of those issues. Uh, one of the other things is streamers love it. Uh, the people have been streaming uh, Fantastic Contraption and Mixed Reality ever since it came out because it has really, really robust mixed reality tools already built into it. And the Alchemy Labs and the Northways have actually integrated Twitch chat into the game so you can interact with your player, or interact with your viewers rather, without having to take off the head mount display. There's a billion awesome things about that. Um, the thing about Twitch is the quality doesn't necessarily have to be as high. You know, like I came from a visual effects background where you're literally spending months moving pixels around, so this kind of stuff bothers me to no end. But for kids watching it on YouTube or on Twitch, they love it, right? So, and people are starting to do this live too, which is crazy. So this was at E3 a couple weeks ago, Valve had a booth set up, they're doing Space Pirate Trainer, and this was with a locked off camera, mind you, which makes it a bit easier. So they were able to show people on a monitor right next to the booth what it looked like inside of VR. And this is a picture I pulled from Reddit earlier this week. This is in Akihabara in Japan. They've got like this little ghetto booth set up at the back of some crazy store where they're doing mixed reality. So it's pretty neat to see this stuff sort of propagating. And I had to you throw this in there. Somebody did a joy of painting painting Ooh, Bob Ross right with Tilt Brush. Maybe, maybe add some it's like three minutes long. It's amazing, just Google it. It's so variety. good. <laughs> so, talking about a fantastic contraption. So there's basically three things that we did uh, to make this sort of come across and be really cool. So we composited the player into the virtual environment and this basically is all the stuff on the green screen. And then we did the inverse of that, which is sort of taking the virtual items, or virtual items, virtual objects rather, and bringing them into the real world. And I really, really thought, uh, thought this was cool and I really wanted to try to do this in a good way. So, and the third way we did this is we also filmed an in-game avatar that was shot using a real camera in the real world. And this is actually something that's been going on for a very, very, very long time, though the price point has gotten to the point where we can literally do this now with a Vive controller and some fun tech and rubber bands and a ghetto study cam that cost me $5. On the left is something similar to what they were, you know, doing pre-visualization with, with Avatar and like other huge, big, big Hollywood movies. And now it's gotten down to this, which I can do in my basement, which is amazing. So to sort of back up, give a little bit more background on how this whole process started, uh, basically there is a, a company called Breakwater Studios that was hired by Unity to do a developer profile piece on the Northways who were developing Fantastic Contraption. And Colin kind of came up with the idea, like, okay, let's try taking a third Vive controller, we'll duct tape it to the camera, we'll try to get the FOVs and position to match, and we'll shoot it and see how it looks. And this is basically what they got out of it. And there's a couple of mixed reality-ish shots in here, and they basically just overlaid the footage at 50% opacity. And when this video went online, I think it was in like January or late December or whatever, I remember I just freaked out. It's like I was emailing Andy and I was emailing Colin. I was like, this is incredible. Like, okay, we could do this way, 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 way better. And then like my mind just started exploding with the possibilities of how we could do this, right? So in January, they got in touch with me and they're like, yeah, we want to do this. And so then we began the long process of figuring out how to do this well. So the first problem is how do you pair a third Vive controller to your Vive? Because the Vive only supports uh, two controllers because there's only two USB uh, controllers, in, or two uh, Bluetooth dongles in it rather. 
So there's a couple ways to do it. The easiest way is you get a third Vive controller by either buying another Vive or begging a friend, and you would attach a giant long USB cable to it, and then it'll be recognized. Problem with that is it limits camera mobility, and it you know, can kind of throw off stabilizers and things like that. The other way you can do it is what we experimented with at the beginning was taking an old DK1 controller and putting that on top of the, the camera and then attaching that, the, basically the, the dongle that comes with it to the computer and then boom, your third controller shows up. Works great-ish, but the older controllers are more sensitive to light and all sorts of weird things and they're kind of janky in some cases. The batteries don't last long. We needed to work for a 12-hour shoot and I was like, I do not want to use these controllers. So luckily enough, we were able to get a Vive controller paired to a dongle that Valve flashed for us and sent to me like overnight within like six hours, it was insane. <laughs> they have some sort of magic shipping powers and that worked fantastic. So once we had the Vive controller, this obviously on the left is not the setup we used, we'll get to that in a second, but that's kind of how we tested it. So the big sort of elephant in the room and question is how the heck do you calibrate these two things and how do you get the, the third person camera inside of the game to line up to the FOV of your live action camera? And it's a really, really hard problem. And right now it's completely manual. And what the Northways did is they built all these sort of uh, in-game tools. They basically gave me a way to position, uh, offset position and rotation in X, Y, Z, and modify the FOV in very, very, very small increments. So I can make a tiny adjustment. And basically what I would do is over, over here on the right, you can see I'm overlaying the controllers in-game on top of my live action footage. And this is not accurate at all. You can see the one on the left is off a little bit. But basically what you would do is I would put them on the floor, I would tweak a couple values until things kind of looked right, and when it looked okay, I'd move them to another position in the room and move them all around the bounds, like as close to the camera as I could, as far away from the camera as I could. And after we got good at this, it took about 20 or 30-ish minutes to get a decent calibration every time we would change the position or the lens because any time you change that thing, the calibration has to change. And depending on the camera you're using, if you're using a crop sensor camera, a full-frame sensor camera, or using a cheap lens that has fisheye distortion on the lenses or rectilinear lens, there's all sorts of things that can throw this process off and make it a complete POS right now. It's a pain in the butt. So hopefully down the line, someone will come up with some, some magical computer vision solution where we wave around a wand in front of it and it goes bink and it does it all for you, but right now we're not there yet. Um, so hopefully that comes. And this is just a close-up of that uh, little bit of misalignment too. But I was really, really excited about this, and so I spent all the time I could to get a good calibration. And this is basically the first test I did just literally in my basement. So and cameras are close, put on the head mount display, and I do this little calibration here where I move the controllers up and down, and that's so I can sync everything in post-production. So I'm and then I just start moving things around, and it looks pretty cool. So I posted this online, and people were like, wow, that's really neat, and I'm like, hey, we're just getting started. So later that evening, I convinced my wife, I'm like, you gotta come downstairs, like, I gotta move the camera. And so she put on the head mount display, she started moving things around, and immediately we're like, whoa, this is really, really neat. But you could tell my, cal my camera calibration was off. Needed to spend a little bit more time on that. Next day or a couple days later, whenever it was, convinced my friend Vince to come over to my basement. I was like, dude, we need to hang out and try this. <laughs> so I got him to just play in fantastic contraption and I've got my you know, ghetto steady cam rig there and we're just shooting this in my basement. And it's a little bit shaky. The controller was still being attached with rubber bands so it wasn't completely rigid. So that's why there's a bit of shake there. But we were sort of figuring out like what are all the problems we're gonna need to solve here by doing this. And this is one of the last tests we did. And you can sort of tell just by watching him, like he's missing shortcuts every now and then, throwing pieces away, you know, and he's, he's playing, but it's not super, super engaging. So like we're sort of realizing like this is gonna have to be very, very scripted. We're gonna have to like really make sure that we have a set number of shots that we need to do. We need to figure out exactly how to do them and rehearse them because it literally is like you're performing this stuff live, like kind of like you're on stage when you're on, when you're on set shooting. So lots of multiple takes, lots of testing, everything, yada, yada, yada. And so in the end, we realized that my ghetto camera was not going to be suitable for what we were trying to do here. So we decided to shoot on a Movi Steadicam. We got a Canon, or not a Canon, sorry, a Sony a7S II, and we literally just held the controller on top of there with zip ties, tape, and a bunch of putty. And it was really lock solid, but it was enough to work. Uh, we didn't shoot with a red or you know super high-end cameras for various reasons. Uh, mainly that we just wanted to use the Mobi because it's a really nice steady cam that's easy to use, and they had one, uh, the crew that I was working with. And the, if we had a bigger camera in there, we actually couldn't get the Vive controller to fit in there with enough clearance because the lighthouses still need to be able to see that controller, right? And so if any things that are obscuring it were going to be an issue, and the Mobi worked really, really well for that. 
So uh, once we figured that out, got everything working with that camera, and we calibrated the, the camera to that lens, this is the shot that we did in the basement. And this is by far the most popular thing I've ever tweeted in my life. <laughs> it went kind of crazy. But this is with all those things in place. The camera is nice and stable. We're using a nice wide lens. Uh, it's nice and smooth, and it feels really, really, really weighty and solid, and it feels really professional, and that's exactly what we were going for. So one of the things we kind of experimented with was uh, different frame rates and capturing, at, say, 24 or 30 or 60 frames per second, and people were like, oh, you got to do 60, you got to do 60, and 60 kind of sucks because any sort of little micro jitter or, you know, you, you step over something or just like, six, there's a lot more temporal resolution at 60 frames per second versus 24 frames per second, and 24 frames a second has a way of kind of smoothing out all of those details so that you might be capturing that you don't really want to see. So we decided to shoot at 60, or sh sorry, shoot at 24, but I captured all the gameplay at 60 frames per second and then I conformed it to 24. The other thing we did, which was kind of an uh, interesting little hack, is I captured everything with a uh, 90 degree shutter rather than a 180 degree shutter. So there's less motion blur on the live action footage. And that kind of helped smooth everything together. And then I added motion blur to the entire composite in post to kind of make sure that it didn't feel juddery. So lots of little tiny tricks. But some people are doing 60 frames per second. This is a very, very old example of Audio Shield. And this is a 60 frames per second video. You can kind of tell how smooth it is here. Um, the problem is, or the thing that they're kind of hiding, rather, is that you, you don't really see the person, right? You're kind of silhouetted, and the camera is static. If you can get a good calibration and things are static and you're mainly focusing on the gameplay, it actually looks really, really awesome. As soon as you start to move that camera, if things are misaligned, it starts to go all over the place very, very quickly. So you kind of just need to be aware of what you're trying to achieve here and just sort of keep that in mind when it comes to frame rate. So after figuring out all those problems, now it's time to go into production and sort of put the pedal to the metal, so to speak. So when you're on set and on green screen, you know, time is money and there's lots of people waiting around and it's not really the time for experimentation, it's the time to execute. And so we really needed to make sure we had a game plan and I had like an entire shot list of everything we needed to do. So as far as the output from, uh, from the game or from inside of Unity, this is basically what we output. Now I'm gonna talk about how I would change this a little bit later, but this is what we used at the time. So in the upper right hand quadrant, we basically have a foreground layer that is composited against blue. The upper left hand uh, quadrant is the background. Lower left hand quadrant is a composite of the forward and background. And the lower right is the smooth companion cam view from the head mount display. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And the way we did this is we were outputting at 2560 by 1440 split into four quadrants, which essentially gave us four 720p quadrants to work with. And we had talked about trying to do a 4K screen, which would give us four 1080p views. But honestly, I like 720p is fine. Most people are watching this stuff on their phone. Don't worry about 4K. Nobody cares, <laughs> you know, especially for this stuff. And it just in terms of raw processing and output from the game, you need to throw that many more pixels at it. So we're pushing four views simultaneously to the computer and then 90 frames a second to both eyes inside of the Vive. So you're pushing things, right? Fortunately, Contraption is very optimized and the graphics are relatively light. So it handled this with ease. I was running this on a 980 Ti. Um, the one thing to note about this, that if you've ever played around with the Steam VR stuff, is they use a Z clipping method. And what we, or what uh, Colin actually came up with, which is the best way to do this, is the objects don't Z clip. They physically pop in and out when they go from in the foreground and background. There's a Oh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But they physically pop in and out from the foreground and background rather than being clipped in the middle. And basically the way we're defining where things are going from foreground to background is the position of the head mount display. So if he's going like this in front, oops, sorry, if he's going like this in front of him, everything in front of his head is going to be in the foreground layer. And then as soon as he moves behind it, pops into the background. So if you played around with Steam VR's sort of built-in kind of mixed reality stuff, this is kind of what you get. Uh, this is just a really quick test I did with it, just to sort of illustrate it. But what they do is they put the foreground alpha in upper right-hand corner, foreground and left, and composite view in the lower left-hand corner, and raw head mount display view in the lower right, which is basically unusable. I'm not really moving the head mount display, I'm just moving the camera here. But you can see what happens when you move the camera around with the Z clipping method. If things get cut in half, and every time you move the camera, the Z clipping chain, plane changes. And when you end up compositing this stuff, you get this thin black line in the middle. And I mean, it's possible to remove that in post to an extent, but it's not ideal. It, the best way that I hope in the future, in the next trailer that I do, the way I want to do it is use this method to separate the elements because having your alpha and then alpha, the alpha in the one corner and then foreground on black is great because in post you can basically divide that by the alpha and then you 
you multiply that over top of your, your uh, lower left hand quadrant there, and it's a really, really great composite. It's better than the blue screen method that we did, but this method sucks for live streaming, which is what the Northways were focusing on initially. So we'll see if we're able to work that out down the line. So in any case, there's a bunch of other stuff we added into the game that we sort of realized this is, there's a slate um, because when you're on set and you're in production and you're doing this stuff and things are moving fast, you don't have time to rename files and whatnot. So when the cameraman is hitting record on the camera and I'm hitting record on the computer, sometimes people will hit it accidentally and you'll get different takes and you can't rely on file names in order to sync things up and post. So I needed a visual way to do that. So Colin literally added a button that I would hit that would bring up a slate so it would be captured raw into the, or like right into the footage. So then I could go on the camera and there's a physical person holding a physical slate and we could line them up that way. The other and probably one of the most important things that we added was this thing called world rotation. And so if you've ever thought about like a green, here I'll just turn it down a bit. If you've ever thought about a green screen cove, you've got about 180 degrees to work with. But if you wanted to shoot something that's the other way, how do you do that? So they, uh, Andy actually built in a tool that rotates the entire game world in 90 degree increments. So if I wanted to say get a, a shot of someone from a reverse and then get the, you know, one degree of that, we just hit a hotkey twice, and then we could do both shots, and the cameraman is basically facing the same direction in the cove against the green screen. And it, we wouldn't have been able to do these trailers if it wasn't for having added to that, because there's, there would have just been impossible shots that we wouldn't have been able to get, because there's no such thing as a 360 degree green screen cove, it just doesn't work. So that worked incredibly well. But these are all these little tiny things that come up that you never really realize when you think about, like, how are we actually going to do this well? So, the green screen shoot. Uh, if you've ever been on set, this is what it feels like. <laughs> Um, it's hectic, it's stressful, time is money, etc. We did about 12 hours on set. We did four hours of setup one day to make sure to, we got the, the positioning of the lighthouses all correct and everything, and everything would work. And then we did a really, really long eight hour day of shooting, and we shot Job Simulator and Fantastic Contraption at, on the same day. So, um, one of the interesting things is we didn't really know exactly where we were going to put the lighthouses for this, but we ended up basically where this time-lapse camera is right now is in the other corner of the green screen, and that's where the lighthouse is. It's right above it, and you can see the other lighthouse on that far corner over there. And we did it that way rather than putting them both at the far back because uh, we were losing tracking a lot on the third controller on the camera when we were in certain positions, and this setup gave us the best tracking for everything. We had pretty much zero tracking issues except when there was um, uh, it, it was being obscured. Like if the person playing the game was in the middle and the cameraman was in between that and the two lighthouses, they, they just lost tracking because the lasers just weren't hitting it right. So certain positions were bad, but once we sort of learned that, we kind of just worked around it and just you know took the good parts of the footage that we could. So the next thing we're gonna look at is how did we actually do every single take? And basically I came up with this huge checklist that we had to go through. There's this camera calibration, we had to roll camera, roll gameplay, slate the camera, slate the gameplay, uh, turn off the in-game controllers so they didn't misalign with the real live controllers. And we had to do that on every take. So this is kind of just an example of that. Camera is rolling. Camera's rolling, gameplay is rolling. Slate one. Good controller calibration. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay, we'll have to watch for that. Things you learn. <laughs> okay, controllers off and action. So this is basically just like a raw, this footage isn't composited properly or anything, but it kind of gives you just an idea of what a raw take looks like that then gets edited into something interesting. And you can see, like, once you pull around to the side, the light stands show up because they're in the corner of the cove. So there's post involved. There's rotoscoping involved to remove those things. And I kind of told the camera guy, I'm just like, just get all the cool shots. I don't care if I have to roto for three days or a week or whatever. You know, I spent eight years doing that. And it's not really that big of a deal, but if you're trying to do it live, it obviously doesn't, it's not go. great. Okay, but add. it's something you have to keep in mind. There's going to be post Camera work involved to clean up the key Camera's and rolling. clean up all that yeah, kind of other stuff. So next thing we're going to look at is the stuff we shot in the house. And I really wanted to do this thing here where we would show the player inside of the virtual environment and then mirror that into the home. And Fantastic Contraption is this really, really, like, it's a great game because it's a social VR game. You can have people over and they're playing it, like, they're on your couch and they're helping that person build the contraption, right? And we kind of wanted to show that in the trailer because they'd done that in one previously and it really responded, it resonated well with people. But I wanted to have the actual contraption in the living room this time. So in this case, what we had to do is we were not only mirroring it to the computer four times, we were also mirroring it to a TV in the living room at 1080p and to the Vive. So think about that. You're rendering your game one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times now. So 
again, Contraption handled it perfectly well because it's a lighter-ish game, but that may be a problem for super, super heavy games that are already struggling to, you know, get 90 frames on the Vive itself. So uh, we captured the gameplay at this case at 30 frames a second on the computer. There's just technical problems that, because of that, but I got a fix for that. So hopefully the next time we'll be able to do that better. But this looks really cool. And the way we did this is just a slight tweak to the uh, quad system. What we ended up doing is taking the foreground and background and just putting them up against blue and you kind of see the disembodied eyes there. That's kind of just a glitch, but whatever. Um, they go away after a second. But we just took both of those views and just composited everything in front and everything in front of the player that was in the living room. And it worked out really, really, really well. Like, it just felt really neat to see all these things hovering. So it didn't matter if it was actually that you'd been accidentally behind her or in front of her. We just made sure everything was in front. And nobody's really called me out that that should have been behind. So I think, I think it worked pretty well. So the next thing I want to talk about just really briefly here is uh, first-person footage. Now, the Job Simulator trailer was mainly first-person footage for just various reasons. We can get into and If someone has questions about that, you can ask me later. But we wanted to make sure that we had a good camera smoothing method. And if you're going to capture first-person footage from your game, you have to have camera smoothing. There's just really no way around it. So what they ended up doing is like a Andy wrote this thing where it, like, you know, it takes the, the head mount display position and it sort of smooths it out, right? And so you're not getting all those little micro jitters. Your head is really the worst camera of all time. Things that feel super natural inside of the head mount display look awful on a 2D screen. Going like this, head tilt feels great in the head mount display, but on 2D or in the screen, it looks completely horrible. So you really need two people. When I was capturing all this footage, I had a friend that was playing the game and I was watching it and then we swapped out vice versa just to give everybody a break because you have to be able to see what you're actually capturing and there's no way to do that inside the head mount display. So he was telling me, it's just like, you know, put your arms up a little higher and it's like my arms are down here where it feels natural but you don't actually see the hands in that case. Your hands have to be in this kind of like T-Rex claw position like that and it feels super unnatural when you're playing a game like this but you have to do that if you want to see the hands in there. Super weird. And the other thing that's interesting is how much emotion comes through from just the head and seeing hands. You are literally acting. There's this one little shot in the job simulator trailer where we're getting held up by this dude with a banana. We did, I, I don't know how many takes are in here, but there's a lot of different takes. There's a lot of different ways you can put your hands up and, you know, go like this. We tried just moving the camera to the side. We did things where I'm like shaking my hands and moving back and doing it myself, like I'm going like this, right? But then all of a sudden my hands aren't being visible. So I got to remember to keep my hands out like this. And my friend that's watching the, the, the footage being captured on the computer, he had to tell me all this. There's no way for me to see this. It's a multi-person effort. So you are literally acting. And I just didn't really expect that. It's really interesting. So as far as post goes, I mean, this is kind of the boring part. It's just sitting in front of After Effects for many, many hours. Um, since I come from a visual effects background, this kind of stuff is sort of second nature to me. But I mean, there's a lot of little gotchas, right? There's a lot of rotoscoping. There's a lot of like, you know, keying issues, keying hair is sometimes a problem. It's not just a one click, you're done kind of solution, right? So the one thing that's interesting is I had to take the footage from that we captured from the gameplay and the camera and just do rough composites of every single shot. We did 90 takes on the green screen and about 30 at home. So I had to align all of that footage and just do A over B and then spit it out before I could even see what we had. And then I had to edit with that. So there's a long process to just even see the, the footage. So one of the other interesting things that kind of came up was we shot a bunch of B-roll of just the people on the couch watching our friends play. And they were relatively new to VR, and I kind of wanted that. I wanted people that had never really been in it too, too much because their enthusiasm really comes across, like anytime you put somebody new in there. <laughs> and so they were super excited, and all their reactions were very, very genuine. And I edited a bunch of this stuff into the first cut of the trailer, and Colin was like, yeah, the acting's kind of cheesy. And I'm like, you know, they're, they're not actually acting. That's real, genuine emotion, but it comes across as cheesy. Right? And it's sort of like the we fit or the, like the we kind of commercial, like sort of, what's the word I'm looking for there? It's like, it's like the problem with those commercials, right? That you see these people having fun and you think, oh, that's got to be fake. But no, it actually was all real. So it's kind of weird. We actually ended up cutting most of the, the reaction shots that were like, I thought were super awesome. And on their own, they're kind of fun to look at. But it just made it feel cheesy and not really like it. Too. That's real. I didn't tell them to do that. <laughs> but couldn't use it in the trailer. Really weird. So, uh, 
problems and hopes for the future. There's a whole bunch of things that I really hope uh, we can solve down the line. And one of the big ones is support for more than two lighthouses for the Vive. I guess Vive 2.0 is probably going to have to be whatever solves this. Uh, but basically, we would, I really want 360-degree tracking with no, you know, no obstruction and no occlusion whatsoever. Because there is definitely occlusion issues um, that we were running into on set. And you know, even when you're playing the games at home, sometimes you run into that. But I want four lighthouses so we can just beam that whole room full of lasers, and that's just one other problem we don't have to worry about. The second thing I really want is a dedicated tracking object for cameras, and I mean, this was kind of a pipe dream up until I guess it was yesterday when uh, Valve like open sourced the, the entire just like lighthouse system. So if anybody's a hardware manufacturer out there and is wanting to make like a specific mixed reality camera attachment, please talk to me. I've got some ideas on how that we could make that. Um, but that's something that needs to happen because gaffer taping your Vive controller to your camera is not really a professional solution, although it did work. <laughs> so you need like 100% solid lock, something with screws in it that you don't, you know, it can just be completely locked and, you know, you can modify it and, you know, anyway. What we did was not ideal, but it did work. So the next thing that would be really neat is support for more of these. So let's say you had wanted to shoot like a virtual sporting event and you had different cameramen, right? So you could have a cameraman on a long lens and a cameraman on a wide lens and you could have multiple camera people in the VR shoot shooting different things all at the same time, kind of like you're shooting a show or a play or whatnot. And you could, you know, switch all that stuff just like they do in a live broadcast. That would be really, really neat. Can't do it right now though hopefully down the line. Um, another interesting thing is hopefully Valve or some other magical fairy out there comes out with uh, some sort of unified camera calibration system that works with everything. So you can just literally take your Vive, your Vive controller that is a known entity, we know how big that thing is, you wave it around in front of your physical DSLR and computer vision algorithms go magic, boop, and it aligns everything and spits all that output to a file or directly into the game or some way of doing it. Um, that would be awesome because a lot of people struggle with that process. I've got lots of emails from people like, how the hell did you do this? And I'm like, well, Colin built me a really good thing that works really well, but you know, not every game has that. So the last thing is I really hope that someone comes out with a plugin, whether it's Valve or Unity or whatever, or Unreal, I guess, because they need to be included with this too, um, to basically eliminate a lot of the stuff that I've had to just, or they had to build into Fantastic Contraption, rather, the slating system, the world rotation stuff, the way of offsetting the camera. You know, it would be really nice if everybody didn't have to build that from scratch every single time, which is basically what everybody has to do as of today. So hopefully all this stuff will be standardized down the line, and then, you know, this this process won't be as uh, headache filled as it is right now. So to wrap everything up here, we just have like a really quick four minute video that kind of just sort of goes over everything we've talked about today. So we'll just take a look at that now. We are working on the Job Simulator and Fantastic Contraption trailers right now. They're the two of the three launch games that are coming out with the Vive. So when they approached me, I was really, really excited about it. I mean, I just really wanted to be on board with this kind of thing. My background is in visual effects, and I used to work on like a whole bunch of different Hollywood movies. After I got out of the visual effects industry, I sort of transitioned into video games and started doing more motion graphics. But these two trailers are the first ones that really merge those skills in like a really, really nice way. So generally speaking, I'm literally a one-man shop in my basement making game trailers, but for this, I knew we would need a green screen studio, we'd need a camera crew, we'd need people on set, we'd need actors, and so all of a sudden, your needs are just growing exponentially. So I called Handcraft, and uh, they were like, yes, let's do this. And so then we started figuring, okay, what cameras are gonna we shoot with? What are we gonna use to stabilize the camera? We need to figure out which camera would actually fit in the stabilizers, and like, you know, how do we attach the third Vive controller to that, and will that throw the camera off, and blah, 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 it just keeps mounting on top. Up, right? And we did that first test in the basement and I put it on Twitter and just exploded. People were like, whoa, my God, this is crazy. And so we knew we were onto something. So today here we're recording VR uh, trailers, which is kind of this new thing that people haven't had to think about before. Um, and we're doing that with a green screen and doing some mixed reality stuff where we can kind of put superimpose people into the actual game with the hope of being able to explain to people what VR is like. Actually showing people inside um, VR for the first time, that's really, really uh, magical and I think will kind of allow people to understand without trying it, just a little bit of what this stuff is going to be like. 
Job Simulator is a game coming out for all three VR platforms, the Vive, the Oculus with the Touch, and PlayStation VR. It's a game where robots have taken over all jobs. It's the year 2050, and so they created the simulator to simulate what jobs used to be like, so these future humans could experience what it was like to job. Fantastic Contraption is a video game for VR, where you uh, use your hands and you walk around, and uh, you make a contraption, so you make a machine. You use these simple tools, you use just wheels and sticks, and you basically try to get from over here to over there. Basically, every single time we would do a take on set, there was like this checklist of things that we would need to go through. So like the first thing we would do, make sure that the camera is rolling and then make sure that I'm capturing gameplay on the computer. And we would have to get people to do a calibration of their hands with the controllers visible. And the reason we needed to do that is we needed some way to align the footage from the gameplay and the camera in post-production. So the screen would be split up into a foreground layer, a background layer, a composited layer, and then what the player was actually seeing through the head mount display. So you were capturing all four of these views live at the exact same time um, as they were playing. This is awesome. Kurt's crazy. As soon as like we had our first Skype call with Kurt and he was telling us all his ideas, I was like, that's impossible. And after we saw the first few of his screen tests, it was, it was pretty mind-blowing. People aren't going to realize how much work this was. It's like, oh, they shot it on green screen, it's all computer. But no, what we actually did is we shot the gameplay live. So the gameplay was actually being captured at the exact same time. We didn't go in in Cinema 4D or Maya and rebuild all this stuff. So literally, it took two days of doing rough composites of every single one of these shots and just layering everything in, lining them all up exactly on the right frame, and spitting that all out into this big collection of files. Then once you have that, you can actually start looking at it and sifting through the footage. It's really the best way to showcase virtual reality. It's the best way to show that that person is in that environment and manipulating those objects. And a lot of people you just say, you have to try it in order to experience it. And I think that these mixed reality videos are the best way that we can get that feeling across, you know, in a 2D format without having the headset on. Being involved in like the first of these kind of things is like really, really fun. It's fun to like work through all the technical problems and it's fun to like figure out how to shoot in VR and what things you need to do to make that look good. So it was stressful, but it was really exciting at the same time. Thanks, guys. So I was told we have about five minutes for q and I think there's people out there with mics. If uh, I see one over there, so flag a, flag a mic down if you have a question. Thank you. That your footage there looks amazing. Thank you. Uh, you know, for a developer that's looking to uh, you know have a video like this done for their game, what would the budget be? Like, what would it, you know roughly be to do something in line? I don't know. With this? What's the budget for your game going to be? <laughs> it's a, it's really an impossible question because literally every trailer is different, right? Some are going to require no actors. Some may require a dozen people. Some may require three or four days on set. And so all of a sudden your costs are growing and contracting by you know tens of thousands of dollars potentially. So it's it's not like you can do these for cheap, but you know, I'm, Can you share what roughly the budget was for these? I don't uh, want to share that, I think, but you know, get in touch with me. If you're interested and really want to do it, you know, email me, and okay. we can talk about it. Thanks. That was really fascinating. Awesome. I'm curious, what tools and software and workflow did you use for live monitoring and live compositing? So we didn't composite it live. So we captured the footage separately. The footage was being captured on the camera, and the cap footage was being captured on the computer. And then I composited them in After Effects and Post. But in order to do the camera calibration setup, where we were figuring, you know, just layering the footage on top just really loosely, we were just using OBS, which is free. Um, there's all sorts of other software out there with, that would work, but Colin had been working with that, you know, to get the live streaming stuff already going with Fantastic Contraption. So I just used his, and I mean, there's probably other tools out there, but it worked. How long did it take from the time you agree to do it to the time you had the finished product? Um, well, it's, it's not like I'm working on it, you know, eight, ten hours a day every single day, right? I'm, like, I'm doing other stuff in between. I'm a, I'm a dad as well, right? So I got two kids. I can't sit in front of the computer all day. But um, they got in touch with me in early January, and they came out when the Vibe launched, like, early April. So we were working on it that entire time. I mean, like, <laughs> I think we lost a month and a half just trying to communicate with Valve to actually just get them to ship me a bloody Vive, you know, because at the time they weren't out yet, right? We were like, they were begging Chet. It's like, Chet, like, get this guy the Vive. And we're like, yeah, he's on the list. And I'm like, nobody really needs it like yesterday. And I'm like, yeah, I'd really 
you're like, I have a vibe now. So, yeah, we wasted time doing that. But, I mean, like, we were doing other R&D as we could, right? Um, but once I got the vibe and we figured out how to get the controller synced, it was pretty fast and furious. It was, it was probably about a month and a half or more. I can't remember. It was kind of a blur, to be honest. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hey, uh, for the post process that you're doing with that, is that strictly like a 2D thing, or are you also getting like 3D camera data and positional data? <laughs> that would with be really stuff? interesting. So, uh, no, we're not getting 3D camera data. Okay. Like all the compositing and all the post stuff I'm doing is just 2D and After Effects. But I did some tests where I just like I 3D camera tracked the gameplay footage and sort of I wish I had that clip with me and I composited like the Fantastic Contraption logo into the mixed reality footage which wasn't there. And I mean that's easy. You just well easy quote unquote right. You just 3D track the the gameplay footage and then you can get your 3D solve out of that and then you could actually add extra stuff in there. So that's something that definitely could be done. Didn't really experiment with that too too much with this, but that'd be cool down the line. Yeah. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, did you uh, use the same machine that was um, playing the game to also record? Yeah. <laughs> so next time we do it, I don't want to do that um, just because there's a lot of overhead involved. So I was using uh, Bandicam to record the gameplay footage. It's like 20 bucks or whatever. Uh, but it has uh, some sort of like a GPU encoder on it that uses like some NVIDIA magic and it, just, it worked. But I mean, I think that's also because, you know, Contraption's a lighter-ish game, and we, we were able to throw around all these pixels, and it wasn't, like, killing the GPU. Like, I was using a 980 Ti, and, I mean, like, it, it worked great. I mean, every now and then, yeah, we get a few drop frames, but what I would do in post, like, if I saw that there was, like, you know, a misalignment after a couple seconds, you just, like, you know, chop that part out and don't use it or whatever, right? So there was ways of getting around drop frames and problems like that, but, um, yeah, what I want to do down the line is I want to take the output from a computer and capture it on a second computer and that would eliminate at least a little bit of overhead on that one machine like I'm surprised it didn't catch on fire but yeah <laughs> it all worked yeah I got one more yeah um, sure um, if if I was to make a green screen room in like my house would you recommend using like a fabric or like painting the walls depends or? like I, you know, when, if you're just doing it for live streaming and it doesn't have to look like, you know, a Hollywood shoot or you don't want it to be that professional, yeah, sure. Like Colin, like Northways have a, a guide on their blog. It's like, here's all the stuff you need to buy. Webcam, here's where you get your, you know, 150,000 feet of green screen fabric. And they literally taped off like an entire quadrant of like their, their condo for months while they were experimenting with this. And I mean, the results aren't as good as this, right? Because in order, like having the green screen is step one. Step two, you need to light the green screen. Like you need a lot of light being pumped at that. So you need to buy a couple hundred bucks worth of lights. Potentially you can't just use the lights that are in your ceiling. They have to be pointed at the green screen and they need to be lit and it needs to be as even as possible. I mean, if you're just doing it for Twitch or whatever, or just like, you know, little YouTube videos, it's okay if there's a little bit of like green spill and it's not perfect. But I knew for what we wanted to do, I didn't want to deal with that headache, right? We wanted a professional studio with it was already lit like there was six lights like a rack of lights atop of this cove that we were in the cove was huge and I mean it was it wasn't perfect even with all of that there was still like you know darkerish areas but it's way better than trying to do it yourself yeah if you want something to do something like this don't try to do it in your basement yeah but it depends on what you're going for right thanks yeah hello hello so it surprised me that what didn't make your list was having multiple renderers all running off the same controls and viewpoints and camera heads. What do you mean by multiple renderers? Multiple physical boxes of compute to make Well, that might be doable, but I mean, considering how quick we had to do this, I mean, like, we, oh, oh, I don't clear, think... Clearly, but it was your wish list. Well, my wish list to have different renderers, no. My wish list is to have different cameras so we can shoot at different points. But at that point, yeah, we might be getting into multiple machines running the same code with the same tracking data being fed to both of them, which is an interesting idea. Um, that's just, I don't know, we'd have to figure that out. That's an interesting problem. <laughs> Hi, uh, Adam Levin, Visionary Hi. VR. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Hi. Hey, Kurt. Um, <laughs> So how come how come there's only one flight out of Winnipeg uh, per year, um, and when are you moving to Los Angeles? Ah, uh, yeah. So yeah, the million dollar question, right? So I'm a dad, you know. I got a pretty good quality of life where I live. <laughs> that's that's the main issue. Like you know, I, I love doing this stuff, but doing it remote is 
not really feasible because there's so many variables. Like one of the things I thought of, you know, when I was up at three in the morning stressing about all these shoots is like, oh my God, is the floor of that green screen made of concrete or wood? Because if it's wood, things are gonna wobble. And then we gotta mount them from the ceiling. And then how do we mount them from the ceiling? And are they gonna wobble when they're from the ceiling? And I'm stressing out at 3.30 in the morning. And I can't, I can't do all that stuff remotely, right? You have to really be there in the space. And there's just, there's so many variables, like more than what I talked about here, that it, to try to coordinate something like this remotely and then just like parachute in and shoot for a day and parachute out, I would probably be more stressed doing that than trying to do it back home, right? So it is possible to like, you know, like you just have to trust the person that's doing it, right? So, yeah. Okay, I think we're done. If anybody else has any other questions, hit me up. I'm gonna be here all day. If you wanna to talk to me, shoot me a tweet. I'll have my phone in my pocket and just say, I'm at the thing and I'll try to find you. So, <laughs> thank you very much, everybody.